participa un capítulo más de nuestros coloquios IB. Hoy tenemos el placer de presentarles al profesor doctor Thomas Müller, este, invitado este, a nuestro centro atómico. Y bueno, la introducción y la presentación la va a hacer este, el doctor Ingo Mar Alecote. Gracias. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Eh, un gusto. I switch into English now because I expect everybody to understand English for the rest of the talk. So anyway, we can go to English. So it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Müller. Professor Müller is distinguished senior scientist at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. And he is now visiting us in the frame of the Programma Maldacena for visiting professors. For the youngest of you who don't know the Maldacena program for visiting professors, Maldacena is a very distinguished physicist who is ex-student from our institute and he has provided a fund to invite distinguished lecturers and professors to come to the Instituto Balseiro. And in this framework, we could bring Thomas to, to Bariloche. Thomas did his diploma in physics, which is our licenciatura, his PhD and his habilitation, which is sort of a degree after the PhD, all at the University of Bonn in Germany. Then he went to CERN and worked in different experiments, UA5, UA1, so this is proton, antiproton colliders. Then he moved on to UCLA, California, as a professor, and there he also worked in the project of the superconducting super collider. I don't know if you're going to say something about it or if we ask you afterwards about this project. Ask Might be interesting. That's finished. And, and for some years now, uh, Thomas is working at uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology since the 90s, where he was professor, dean of the physics faculty, head of the experimental nuclear and particle physics department, and now is distinguished senior fellow. So he has worked at many experiments, as I mentioned, at CERN, at the Icarus experiment in Gran Sasso, at CDF, which is uh, the Tevatron and Fermilab, at Apex also, and the, the SSC, Bell 2 in Keck, that's Japan, and CMS at the LHC in CERN. So he is member of different committees for the large electron positron committee at the European Committee for Future Accelerators and the European Physical Society. He was also a member of the executive board. His research interest is Hadron Collider Physics, Top Quark, Higgs, Yukawa Couplings, beyond the standard model, but I leave you the word to explain and welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ingo. This was a very nice and lengthy introduction. <laughs> You uh, um, mentioned all the important things. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I um, uh, have the great uh, pleasure and honor to be here in your program, which you just mentioned. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here because it's such a nice area with so nice colleagues. I have, have, was able to meet many of you already now. And so it's, uh, uh, I'm pleased to um, show you a little bit the spirit and uh, some backgrounds of our kind of research in experimental particle physics. Né? I mean, you have a strong group in cosmology and, in, uh, of course, uh, related to particle physics and uh, uh, astroparticle physics and uh, um, cosmic ray physics. And this is sort of a little bit the other side where we have the collider physics. And the background of the, the collider physics we want to uh, do is to understand, indeed, uh, the, uh, well, that's, uh, of course, a little bit said too much, the origin of the universe, nobody will ever tell you. But uh, indeed, we try to uh, approach the situation in the early universe. That is what we want. Now, for those who listened already to my lectures the last few days, there I had a different picture. That picture I had to take out of the internet, and it was later explained to me it was the nicest view in the world. So. Uh, Following Ingo's suggestion, my sister, who's also here today, and I, we walked up the um, uh, roundabout, uh, but that's the second nicest view of the world because it's not the one from where this other picture was taken. It's still wonderful, isn't it? So now I can use that without any uh, little writing here. So 
That was uh, yesterday, and I must say, it's just unbelievable. So you count yourself lucky where you live, yeah? so don't run away. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the mechanism of the Big Bang is easily said because it is just our image, uh, comes out of our understanding. I should be standing here a bit more, I guess. Uh, comes from our understanding uh, of the processes and the fact that the universe is expanding. This is a fact, it cannot be uh, debated. It's uh, um, uh, not debatable that the universe is expanding and we now even know, which is sort of very new and not completely understood, it's expanding at a higher speed even, a higher velocity. But let's uh, look at it. When the ex universe expands, it must have been smaller in the past. And uh, so we stand here at the moment. This is our world nowadays. We see stars, we see cosmic rays, we see the sky, we see uh, otherwise darkness in the universe, and uh, uh, we know the age is around 13.8 uh, uh, billion years, so somewhere here, that's where we are. Now, this sort of symbolizes the size of the visible universe in one dimension. If you go backwards in time, uh, you can uh, easily imagine that the temperature of the universe must have been higher. You know, it's like compressing something. And so in this uh, time area, stars have developed. That was when the universe was one billion years old, already fairly mature, and they formed, uh, the galaxy clusters have formed earlier, of course. But relevant for us particle physics, uh, physicists is to go back more into the past. Atoms were formed when the energies by the cooling down of the universe were just not uh, high enough to ionize uh, atoms anymore, which built, so you have a nucleus with an electron uh, hull. That was around 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And the energy scale we call for the temperature of the universe is in units of electron volt. Electron volt is the kinetic energy of a charged object, un one charged object, in an electromagnetic potential of one volt. That is the energy. So going back um, to um, the uh, 300 second period, the universe was only 10 to the 11 meters large, which is still a little bit uh, larger than our solar system, and um, <clears throat> uh, 300 seconds old. There was the energy scale of the nuclei. Ne? Nuclei uh, um, ha have uh, built uh, nucleons, which is for me always difficult. Kern, it, kern uh, it's a nucleons is sort of composed of protons and neutrons. Still going backwards in time, you come here. Up to here, we know the universe well. We understand everything. We understand that the fundamental particles are quarks, electrons, the binding forces mediated by gluons, W bosons, photons, it's zeros. And that is the world which uh, we feel home at. And uh, that was uh, then around 10 to the minus 10 seconds age of the universe. If you go backwards more, you come to an area where there are question marks. And this is what we try to uh, reproduce in the lab, situations when the universe was only one millimeter big and uh, 10 to the minus 12 seconds old. That is the TeV range. Now TeV is for my friends of the cosmic ray community so low, you ca your detector is not even sensitive to, but for us it's a very, very uh, uh, energetic uh, situation in the center of mass system. Eh? And uh, if you know uh, what happened in the TeV range very well, then you can make some extrapolations to an area which you can never reproduce in the lab. No, that is clear. But you need to formulate theories, and we have theorists here, but they need data from us experimentalists. So that is sort of the um, uh, bottom line of our research. And then the, uh, to um, uh, remind you once more how the, uh, what are the structures of matter now known to us, uh, you find it here. The largest objects we can see is around the size of the universe, 10 to the 26 meters. This is, of course, for those who are not very, uh, uh, very uh, familiar with this dimension, I put it in number here so you can uh, take, read that. You know? uh, and um, for, to observe this, uh, the sizes and distances and 
the happenings, you need astronomical telescopes. Yeah? This is just one galaxy, but of course we have millions of galaxies visible nowadays. If you go to the size of the Earth, 10 to the 7 meters, you use goggles for um, sort of um, observing things, you know, to grasp the dimensions of um, Going back more than the size of human beings, for instance, indicate that's two meters here, uh, the, uh, you do it with the eye. And actually, our brain is formed only from what in the, uh, the eye can really understand. That is what forms us. And uh, our world, however, is bigger and smaller. So we have to make models of this and use instruments. <clears throat> so the smaller parts, you go here, like... Um, uh, these are um, uh, small animals which grow, for instance, when you have sinks or toilets and you don't clean them, you know. I say that to the students, you know, then you find those animals after a certain time. Or in ponds, the like pantoffel tierchen. It's, uh, I don't know what's in English, unfortunately. They are 10 to the minus 4 meters. You use microscopes. Going smaller, you cannot use light uh, as a medium to scatter of uh, structures uh, because the wavelength of the light is too big. You go to, um, you need wavelengths of more energetic objects, named, for instance, electrons. And you scatter high energy electrons, uh, KEV, MEV electrons, on uh, small objects. And this, for instance, is a Buckminster Fullerene. In the 90s, this was sort of the real hit. You know, everybody had to work with fullerenes, and uh, these are carbon uh, molecule, super molecules. You can analyze molecules with this kind of technology. We particle physicists want to go to the smallest parts of uh, the world, and that is quarks and gluons. And for this, we need particle accelerators where we have wavelengths around Fermi size, huh? 10 to the minus 15 meters. So, uh, yeah, this should work. Uh, particle accelerators, how do they work? I will not give you a lot of details because I think this is sort of quite familiar. What you want to do is you want to take as much as possible fundamental particles, so electrons, protons, and you accelerate them to the highest possible velocity and hit them against each other. So to produce in a very small spot, very high energy densities. That you can do with a circular arrangement of dipole magnets, you see here. They, they send uh, charged particles around a curve, yeah? so this is dipole magnets. Those blue things are quadrupole magnets who push and higher momenta magnets who sort of uh, focus the beam. But the relevant thing is that you are able to get particles close to the speed of light into a circle. To accelerate, you do it like it's, it's sort of depicted here. You have an electromagnetic wave which accelerates uh, uh, the um, particles, and this is shown here. For positive particles, it pushes. For negative, it pulls. So this kind of uh, structure here, you see it, uh, is run by klystrons. They inject um, megahertz electromagnetic waves, which have a very high field strength, and they push the particles. So they go round and around until they reach the maximum velocity when they would escape out of the uh, round circle because the magnets cannot hold them anymore. That defines the maximum energy we can reach. The Large Hadron Collider goes up to 7,000 GeV of equivalent energy, kinetic energy of those protons circulating around. Here you see some for illustration. This is uh, now, uh, uh, I don't want to lie, it's a Fermilab to my mi mind, and not the Large Hadron Collider. You see pictures later of that. So we have our tool to um, produce high energy particles. And when we have managed to shoot them against each other at some very small spot, then we have high energy densities, like in the early universe up to several thousand GeV center of mass. No? That is the point. And at high rates. So even though you have in cosmic rays, our cosmic rays can reach fantastic uh, energies, but uh, they are uh, not colliding against each other. So 
that would be very interesting. Uh, they do sometimes, maybe, but we are, don't have apparatus to uh, see that. So this is the most powerful accelerator at the moment. That's at CERN. And you see it's a complicated system, almost like the uh, uh, London suburb, uh, this is London sub uh, uh, metro, you know. So uh, you start uh, using all the old accelerators as pre-accelerators uh, for the final one, which is the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest collider in the world. Yeah, uh, this PDF doesn't show how the beams go. They start here and then they go around here to the SPS and we're ejected in this direction, the PS to the SPS. And then one part of the beam which go this way, protons, and the other part goes this way, this way here. And so they get in both directions. No? And then they run into those collision areas. And there are four collision areas. Here is Atlas. Uh, you know, Argentine is a member of Atlas collaboration. I personally am a member in CMS collaboration, and then there are two others. Okay, um, now you have had such a collision, but you have to also identify what happened in this collision, because there can be millions of things happening. And uh, uh, what happens here, you get out of the pure energy, new matter. Yeah, and antimatter particles, and they reflect when they go uh, outside what happens during this collision because new processes can happen, physics processes. And so you have to identify all those particles when they come out, and you have the possibility to distinguish different kinds of particles, photons, electrons, positrons, muons, hadrons. Yeah? All those can be identified here the scheme is shown here. If you put uh, just measuring devices uh, where you utilize the ionization of particles and where you use absorber material with um, identification devices to look for the energy of particles. Yeah? So you can identify hadrons, like pions and so on, electrons, photons, you see, and you distinguish between charged particles and neutral particles by looking whether a charged particle which makes an ionization in a medium, this ionization you measure in the so-called tracking device. Photons, for instance, they don't do that. Sometimes, uh, sorry, here, they, they sort of go through the particle tracker and then they make an electromagnetic shower. Muons, they go through, but they ionize. Yeah? They are not stopped, usually. Neutrons, they're the same. Then neutrinos, have a so low cross-section of interaction, they go through everything, they just disappear. But they leave a negative in the energy balance. And so you can indirectly conclude there was a neutrino or something else, maybe a dark matter particle. Yeah, I come to that. This shows a little bit more in concrete the schematics of particle identification in the experiment where I work, the compact muon solenoid. And you can see here once more what happens when you have different particles. Of course, you have hundreds of particles, but each has a different signature so you can identify and later put everything together. You get your picture of the so-called event. What is our knowledge? Uh, our knowledge about the structures is here. It's a nice uh, image. You start with crystals, then you go to molecules, you make a step of 10 to the minus seven, you get here to the 10 to the minus 9 meters, that's nanometers. Then you go to the atom schedule uh, is size, that's 10 to the minus 10 meters. The nucleus is 10 to the minus 4 of the atom yeah, times. And then once more, uh, the proton is another 10 to the minus 3. So if you put all together, then uh, the um, atomic, uh, the protons have a 10 to the minus 15 meter diameter and the uh, electrons are point-like. Yeah? And the protons, however, we know, consist of quarks and electrons. And here you see still an older picture that's made by Daisy, and they didn't have such a powerful accelerator, so they uh, have also not such a powerful number. Nowadays, the size of those objects is at maximum 10 to the minus 19 meters. Yeah? That is the 
knowledge. And I'm absolutely sure that they are point-like. So this is point-like. We don't need to look anymore for that. Quarks and leptons are point-like particles. And to illustrate this, I show you this picture. Like, if you live in Karlsruhe, or you work in Karlsruhe, here's the uh, university, here's the institute, there's a high rise uh, of the physics, and you are just a few hundred meters away from the uh, castle, and then if you put a bottom, a shirt bottom onto the castle, and then uh, you know that if the bottom was the nucleus, the uh, inner city was an atomic uh, uh, envelope, yeah? So the, that's the size relationship between nuclei and atoms. If you now take our knowledge of quarks and leptons, 10 to the minus 19 meters maximum size, and you say a no, a bottom has 10 to the minus 19 meters, then the whole uh, atom would be as big as the Earth. Yeah? So that's this dimension. And if you look at this carefully enough and you reflect to yourself, what are we made of? We are made of nothing. We are just nothing. We are just point-like particles, so you can compress yourself together into some very small objects. You know, the rest is, however, not nothing. It's the fields, the strength, the st fields, the electromagnetic field, which shows uh, the um, uh, the atom together, the virtual photons, and the strong field, which holds the nucleus together. And so, uh, so we consist of fields with point-like particles in between. The mass of our body is from the energy of the fields. Don't forget that. Because when I talk about mass, everybody thinks, ah, yeah, the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is not responsible for us. We are special. OK, so much. Um, here are the fundamental forces, just to remind you. Electromagnetic force formulated in those Feynman diagrams. It's the way how you can show an electromagnetic magnetic scattering. You just exchange a virtual photon between two charged objects. Same, the weak interaction, which is uh, responsible for radioactive uh, nuclear decay. Exchange of W bosons or Z bosons. The strong force, which holds together quarks into protons and neutrons, by gluon exchange. And this is just a wild speculation. It's not been proven. Gravity would be uh, proceed through the exchange of another boson, we call it graviton, hypothetical, between massive objects. Yeah? That would be uh, if you had a theory of quantum gravity. I know that some people are working on that, but uh, we have no conclusive uh, evidence for that. So that is the situation with our fundamental forces. The masses are now a new chapter, because if you describe all the forces together, except for gravity, we have a quantum field theory which describes everything consistently, the so-called standard model. Everything fits together. Only the mass is not described by the standard model, but there you are. These are the masses of our visible universe. That's what we see here, not the neutrinos, but we see those. This is what we are made up of. And where you already know, if you add all the quarks and uh, leptons in your body, then you get a few grams. The rest is fields, yeah? that's energy. But if you go to higher generations of particles, then you get really the mass. These are massive objects. I mean, look at this. The electron weighs 500 keV, but the tau lepton, uh, 1.8 MeV. So it's uh, much more massive. The most massive object is the top quark, 173 GeV. Yeah? So uh, that in the explanation that you have those masses, then the standard model still is a, a renormalizable field theory, you need a new effect. And that's done by the so-called Higgs mechanism. I will explain to you the Higgs mechanism. Here you see Peter Higgs, and uh, uh, then uh, also Francois Engler. Those two have gotten the Nobel Prize. Not all, unfortunately, live, and some have not been so much involved into the, uh, the, this formulation of this uh, theory with the Higgs. Uh, so those two got the Nobel Prize, and of course, we, we, we particle physicists in CMS and Atlas, we have found it, but they got the Nobel Prize. And 
because you cannot give to 6,000 physicists a Nobel Prize. That's the problem. Otherwise, we would have gotten it. Anyhow, how does the Higgs mechanism work? Suppose uh, you imagine that you have an unknown person. That's a particle of low mass. This particle walks through a party, uh, which is the Higgs field. Lots of uh, virtual Higgs bosons, uh, field quanta. The particle walks through, and it just goes through. It's not really well noticed, and so then he goes here and drinks his beer. If you are an interesting person, then some of those local bystanders get interested in you and they cluster around you, and so they slow you down. They give you inertia. That's the effect of the Higgs field. No, this is virtue. The Higgs field is virtue. So they cluster around you and slow you down. If you are a celebrity, yeah, uh, well, that's the image of Einstein looking to the side, then, of course, so many uh, uh, bystanders come and cluster around you, you can hardly move anymore. That is uh, because you are a celebrity, so you are a ma very massive object. This is how you should uh, imagine the Higgs field. And believe it or not, the universe is filled with this Higgs field. It's everywhere. Check if you are slowed down. So that's for you. CERN. Um, I mentioned already the CERN accelerator complex. And CERN was founded in 1954 as a, uh, following the, the disaster of the World War II, <coughs> where um, the uh, European nations decided, it was usually uh, before the European nations, we want a kind of a research institute where the research is open, fundamental, brings uh, scientists from all over Europe and the world. No? That was the idea of CERN in '54. It expanded because it was a very successful idea. And it now CERN has 23 member states who pay money to it, yeah, to its $1.2 billion um, budget. It has 3,500 employees, but 12,000 users from more than 100 nations. Also Argentina is user. So, but here are the members and the associate members. Associated in light blue. And so you see here, and, and sorry, associate member in dark blue. And then there are associate members in the pre-stage to membership in the light blue. Yeah, so that is uh, because you still have to contribute certain things to CERN, and you can become member, and, uh, so, so, which is worth it. Um, the Large Hadron Collider was an idea already from the early 80s. In the early 80s, um, they um, planned at CERN the next large accelerator. The standard model was in the forming, and they thought, OK, we must need to know this very accurately. Before, there was a very important discovery of W and Z bosons, the mediator of weak interaction. But the weak, the theory, the fundamental theory, has not been established. It's just uh, we have seen the bosons. No? And uh, so they decided to build this huge electron-positron collider, LEP. Into, and so they had to drill a new tunnel, uh, 27 kilometers around, put experiments and study those electron-positron collisions. During this time already, Carlo Rubia, Nobel Prize winner for this discovery, uh, and later CERN director said, let's make the tunnel big enough so we can also put magnets for a hadron collider. No? And, uh, that was a pure con uh, competition to the superconducting supercollider, which was planned in the United States. And, uh, but Carlo Rubia, he was a very nasty politician. He was angry with the US because his idea of a CERN collider was not accepted by Fermilab. I know all the stories because I was around no, in those days. And uh, yes, he said, we built a competition to the SSC. Let's see that we are ready before. Now, the SSC uh, would have been a larger collider, uh, 84 kilometers in circumference, much more powerful, and it would have been better for us human beings that it would have been built, and CERN instead something else. I must say that, yes, even though I'm part of the LHC community, because the SSC would have gone to 40 TeV center of mass energy, maybe strong enough to find supersymmetry. Anyhow, 
That was the history of it. And the SSC later was abolished because it became too expensive. Now it became, uh, the price tag went up to 12, uh, to $11.6 billion. And then uh, Congress decided that's it, no more SSC. And everybody joined the Large Hadron Collider family, the US, US joined. No? Karlsruhe, my institute, uh, I went to Karlsruhe and then I said first thing, we also joined LHC. And the construction started, then we assembled the detectors, and then the LHC started operation, the real operation 2009. Already three years later, the Higgs boson was discovered and the standard model in its formulation was proven and finalized. Let me show you a little bit of this. I mean, this also is in part the future. At the moment, we are data taking uh, collisions which are happening here. Uh, but in 2029, there will be another phase of operation at higher energies, only a little bit higher energies, but also with renewed detectors, because those detectors cannot withhold this uh, radiation uh, much longer. So that's also in the future, but this is uh, already in preparation. So let's see. Um, if you hear Hadron Collider, I mean, sure, many people have heard LHC, Large Hadron Collider, but not all know the concept, yeah, what happens actually. Here you see in the schematics, about 100 meters below the ground in the villages of the Pays de Jex, here is CERN. You see the schematics of this 27 kilometer ring and with uh, four shafts uh, and huge caverns underneath, uh, 50 meter large caverns where you put detectors into the beam. That's the situation. The beam itself, we have two beams, we have um, collisions. So we have two pipes, two magnetic field directions, but all together, very compact. And uh, those pipes, sorry, uh, they um, accelerate in those pipes, bunches of protons are accelerated. Now think uh, what you want to do. We want to collide one proton against one proton. How can you get it so finely focused that a 10 to the minus 15 meter object meets another one? You do it through pure numbers. Like a mosquito swarm. You don't have mosquitoes in Bariloche, I already understood. But if you go to countries where there are lots of mosquitoes, you know what it means, a mosquito swarm. If you take two mosquito swarms, you collide them at the speed of light. There will be mosquitoes who hit each, hit each other, not all of them, but some. Those protons are like mosquitoes, and uh, the 10 to the 11 uh, protons in one bunch, and we have 2,500 bunches uh, in each beam, and they go at the speed of light against each other. And so, in the end effect, what happens is that on each collision of one bunch against another bunch, we get uh, about 100 collisions of protons against each other. So we can choose what is the most interesting uh, uh, situation in this collision event. No? Here you see what happens. You take any, uh, a proton and a proton and they come together. And what we are interested in is not the proton-proton scattering, but rather the sub-constants, the quark or gluon uh, scattering with each other. That is a fundamental interaction. That's fundamental energy, quark and quark anti-quark or gluon and gluon, you produce a new energy system of up to a few thousand GeV. No? The most massive object is a top quark, 170 GeV. So you can produce almost a dozen of top quarks with this kind of interaction at once. We don't want that. We want to look for more massive things, like the so-called supersymmetric uh, objects, which can have a mass of several thousand GeV. That's what we are looking for. And so the collision takes place, and parts of this collision come out. And that's what you need those detectors for. And this is a dangerous uh, situation because the beam has a lot of energy. Imagine 10 to the 14 protons at the speed of light. If they go into the detector all at once because the beam gets unstable, they destroy it completely. Yeah? It's like a uh, train, a fast train, uh, uh, yeah, one beam has the energy of a fast train, 200 kilometers per hour uh, hitting. And uh, 
So, uh, but uh, th this danger is known. Those beams, when they become nervous, which sometimes happens actually the, through um, some resonances in the structure, then they are immediately sent out into the mountain. Then they are gone. Yeah? So, yes, uh, now I did it. The stupid mouse, I mean, <laughs> my, my hand. I hope you can live with my hand. So, um, <clears throat> I should also stand here. I pushed the wrong button. You warned me. Now we have the hand. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, you have a look here um, into the um, uh, tunnel. Uh, this is a, uh, the overall pair of uh, tubes. Here you see the structure. Those are the tubes, one element. Yes, the tubes here. And you see um, the um, coils which form, form the dipole field. It goes down, and here it goes up. And uh, so that's how you are able to shoot protons in both directions, and it's the same direction. So protons go like this, and they go like that. You know? So they, they can shoot against each other. That is realized with this kind of uh, arrangement of magnetic fields. This is a klystron stage, we call it that. This, here you have an electromagnetic wave which you produce and which accelerates the beam. The whole thing that's interesting is cooled with 120 tons of superfluid helium. Now I understand that you also have your helium uh, here, but you have to buy it from the world market. Uh, that's what CERN has to do as well. And then there was a damage in the accelerator, so they had to pump out, uh, warm up the accelerator, and they couldn't store the helium, 120 tons is a lot, so they had to sell it on the market but also hope that they get it back. Yeah? So it was some kind of a negotiation, you know. How can you sell something in a market where the price goes through the ceiling? So I, I don't know. It's, they managed. The helium is back. So uh, that was the situation in 2008. <clears throat> now, for the Higgs boson. I think uh, there are many examples of things we can look for that proceed through similar situation. Look at this. Look at this here. This is an event picture where you see the traces of particles which have pro been produced in one collision, proton-proton, and where you produce the Higgs boson. Now, I can see that, that there is a Higgs boson. You have um, essentially here the, um, uh, from the decay of the Higgs, from a Z0, this red are muons, these are electrons here from the other Z0, and the Higgs boson has decayed into Z0, Z0. For me, that's clear. No? You need a little bit of training. But you need one in five billion of those collisions to find one single Higgs boson. Yeah? And that means you need uh, a haystack of 100 million tons in order to, find, uh, to identify the Higgs boson. That's a challenge. But it can be done. So, and here you see the schematic of one of those detectors. That's the CMS detector uh, where I've been participating. The cost, it has 1,400 tons of weight, a mass. No? It's very massive. It would sink if you put it into the water. Of course, you don't do that. Uh, 3,000 scientists, 1,000 engineers, technicians in 240 institutes. This is just crazy, in 254 countries. The miracle is, and that's what I try to give in my little interview uh, I was asked for uh, as an advice to young people. They learn how to deal with those things. When you become a physicist, you, uh, what I didn't say, but I say to you because you are more senior, you get enormously frustrating, frust uh, tolerant to frustrations, you know. You have to deal with administrations, you have to deal with bureaucracy, you have to get money, and you have everything. So that is something you learn in the hard way, and that is good when you later go to other places like industry or politics. You know, you need good politicians every time again. So let's teach physicists. Yeah, so much for that. Um, here is um, a picture that we had a Christmas party uh, of the CMS collaboration. Not all of them, obviously. This is uh, not so many. Uh, in front of the picture, it's a size, full-size picture of the detector. Uh, but the detector itself was mounted in this hall and later put through a 100-meter-deep 
tunnel into the final collision zone. I'll show you some pictures of that. So here you see just a picture. And I give you a little bit of um, uh, how long uh, do I have? Until half? Good. Uh, then I will manage easily, and I can give you still some more anecdotes, if you like. Um, <clears throat> Uh, here you see uh, the assembly in the hall of the CMS detector. So all the parts were shipped by trucks to the hall, like those red things. This is the iron yoke of the superconducting magnet. And this iron yoke was assembled in a shipyard in Germany, DWE, at the Donau. And uh, so um, you see it has to be in a shipyard. And we had one big problem. Physicists always quarrel. You should know that. And that's why they are so resistant against frustration. So we had the quarrel which color should those uh, magnets have. Yeah? I represented the German groups and uh, well, was a spokesperson those days. And uh, I had a friend and colleague, Dieter Rekaschewski. He represented the Swiss, and the Swiss paid more money. He wanted Ferrari red because his car was a Ferrari. And I was for Camin red. Now something happened. Uh, this is uh, Kanzler. Where do I push? Slowly, your system is falling apart. I mean, Kanzler. No, I mean, I have not do done this. Uh, so, <laughs> in any case, I can continue with. Can you also rem? <laughs> Garda. No, Kanzler. We don't save it. Um, I think some uh, this funny mouse is gone, fortunately. Yes. Uh, so, finish my story. Um, and uh, let me just see if I manage. So, uh, yeah, there you see already. The, the, these, these guys there, and uh, I say guys because it was essentially men in those days who did this. Uh, I don't think there's any woman in this group. Uh, so we all assembled and we had this debate and Dieter Rikaczewski, who paid more money, was, uh, he won. Kamin Road, and, uh, um, and Ferrari Road. I had Kamin Road because that was the UA1 experiment. I preferred because I was from the UA1 experiment. This is Ferrari Road and I like it better. No? I got convinced. So you, sometimes you lose, but you also can get convinced in very important questions. Yeah? So. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, this uh, yoke is then uh, was taken apart and shipped to CERN and assembled. And here you see how the um, coil, uh, how the inner cryostat wall of the superconducting coil uh, gets uh, slid in. And you should note that this is the largest uh, superconducting magnet in the world. No? It's uh, 13 meters long, 6 meters diameter, 4 Tesla. So it's the largest. Everything which costs money was just good enough for CMS. This is a nice story, but I don't get it, unfortunately. Uh, this is um, uh, a so-called hadron colorometer, and uh, that is an absorber made from brass, yeah, actually copper. Uh, it should be copper, but uh, we didn't find uh, 600 tons of copper, so it was brass. Brass is a very elegant thing. Where do you get it from? In those days, the Russians wanted to join this activity, and they didn't have cash, so uh, we asked for in-kind, and we, I mean, uh, not I um, was uh, sort of remotely um, attached, but the, uh, the CMS management asked for in-kind contributions, and uh, so they offered brass. You know? uh, they have the huge uh, Murmansk uh, harbor where they have millions of empty shells, gun shells, from brass, and they were melted and then put into this beautiful uh, uh, device here. So that's uh, how you make out of war things, peace things. And later they can have it back, you know. I mean, this is a lot of money. It's just in those, uh, those things here. So anyhow, um, this tracking itself was in, is, you know, the collisions take place in the heart of the detector and then charged particles go in all directions and they make a little ionization in the silicon strip detectors. So it's a silicon, it functions like a diode, depleted diode, it makes a little electric signal. And so they go through and they say exactly to about 10 micron precision where they went yeah, in all directions. So we can track 
make a track, and we can determine the momentum from the curvature of this track. That's one element. And the Karlsruhe was involved in this uh, detector. Again, if you know, the chip industry builds usually, or your phone has a one square centimeter or half a square centimeter size. This is 200 square meters of uh, size of a high resolution silicon strip. And it operates at 40 megahertz. Anyhow, this was a, a little advertisement for my institute. Uh, that's what we did in the institute. We did radiation hardness tests. By the way, we talked about it. In, we could also do it here at your reactor that because that he has the right flux to test silicon. Maybe I can convince him to take the nice trip here to Bariloche and put those test sensors into your reactor to, and to see how radiation hard it is. Point is you have to cool them afterwards so that they don't have any uh, um, annealing. So we quality control, we manufacture, all those things are made, and I go quickly, and then assembled at CERN, uh, and then slid into the detector at the end. That was sort of the proceeding of building the detector. Everything was mounted in the hall, and then later lowered down with a crane. Here you see a picture of a 2,000 ton crane, which uh, lowers those objects. Now, how do, do you understand that Switzerland has 2,000 ton cranes? What do they need that for? I have no, no clue. They, they must have some very strange uh, uh, research or, I don't know, nuclear bombs or something deep in the mountains. I don't know what they need 2,000 ton cranes for, but we borrowed it, we lent it, and paid money for it. No? It's, it's now back uh, gone. So it was put in slices down in the region, and then assembled to the full device, which is very, very impressive. It never stops impressing me. That's Atlas, where Argentine groups are involved. Atlas is larger in dimension, but it also fills up the hall in a way that you can't really stand in front of it and admire it. It's sort of everywhere. Atlas is everywhere. You can crawl through it, but you cannot see it as, as a total structure. Millions of cables, and they all uh, are analyzed, of course. I don't go into this, I don't have the time. This was the very first collision event, very simple. It was a minimum bias event, yeah? And uh, <clears throat> so um, that was just protons hitting each other and producing hadrons. Uh, for the particle physicist, it's interesting. Does the detector work? You have to find all the objects within your mass window, which we know about. And those were the objects found at electron-positron colliders and found over the years. This is the rho meson, the psi, the j psi, the phi, and so on, epsilon, z0 boson, the w pair production, all this, yeah? It took us one day of operation and we found them all. This, 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 I was impressed. I mean, that was not my doing. I was just impressed when I saw this result. All particle physics of the last 60 years on one day. But this is not interesting. This here is interesting. There should be another peak somewhere. Yeah? We didn't see anything beyond the standard model. That's the point. Now, that's the message I give to you. So far, we have not found. We can go to 3,000 GeV, and we don't find any new mass peak. But nature is symmetric at high energies. We should find something eventually. The question is where. Here you see the schematics, and I'm almost through, so uh, uh, don't be impatient. Here this is the schematics of the standard model. All this has been identified and qualified and understood, more or less, with all its parameters. The standard model has 24 parameters. That's a lot. It's not very fundamental theory, but they are consistent in each other. The only missing link was the Higgs boson I mentioned already. And that was found. I don't go through the mechanism. You find them, and I offer you the copy of my lecture. The production of Higgs is described in my lecture for those who are interested to look it up. This is the image of a Higgs boson, this time decaying into two photons. You can see easily these charged tracks are the debris from the collision, charged particles, hadrons. And you see also here this green stuff. This is the signal from the electromagnetic colorometer. So two 
electromagnetic showers were produced at 60 T GeV energy and nothing through the detector. So that means two photons. Higgs decays into two photons is the process. You can see right away. And if you take this, there are many ways to produce this kind of events, not only Higgs. Millions of other sources can be explained without the Higgs. But if you just put plots them here, and you take the invariant mass of those two, I mean, it can be another direction in another event. If you take the invariant mass of this system here, you end up at a little surplus at 125 GeV of mass. Now, that is the discovery. You can have to cross-check this. You can use other decay channels. Higgs can also decay into ZZ, I told you already. This would be one of them. As you see the red is a muon from the Z0 decay. This green is an electron. So all this you can do. And you see uh, here again in the surplus. Yeah? That's, uh, that's, so it, again, it's the Higgs boson. And this is all consistent with each other. And there you see when it was announced, the discovery, that um, she was the spokesperson of ATLAS, uh, Gianotti. She's now the general director of CERN. Uh, and, um, I'm happy for that. Uh, I know her quite well. Rolf Heuer, he was the general director in those days. And uh, Joe Incandela, he was the spokesperson of uh, uh, CMS. No? So they announced it, and he said, we got it. He's, after the talks, he said, we got it. That was the word from God. You know, I mean, the director of CERN is God in particle physics. So he said, we got it. It must have been there, yes. <clears throat> Later, he was a bit more careful. He said, no, no, it's possibly a Higgs boson. You know why he corrected himself? Well, he wanted to run CERN for years and years and years. Obviously, they probably all told him, how can you say that? We still have to establish it for decades of running, spent money. Anyhow, um, so t a decade after running, uh, after this, uh, we actually uh, made clear it was the standard model Higgs boson and nothing else because of its couplings to the mass. I told you the mass, the, it's actually the inertial mass of objects is given by this mechanism, by the Higgs boson. And that's shown. If you take a light mass object like the muon or the tau lepton, yeah, these are the masses of the particles, bottom quark, top quark here. And you look at the coupling, that means the size of the signal or frequency of producing it, it goes linear, absolutely linear. Or linear is to the square. Yeah? So this is all on one line. For me, the question is solved, that's the Higgs boson. Doesn't mean that there's not another one at high masses, that's true. But the Higgs boson for me is done. You know, I, I am, I'm not doing any Higgs physics for that good reason. I, I don't need. Open questions that uh, addresses all of you, in particular my friends and from the astroparticle side. We don't know what 95% of the universe are made of. No? The energy, the dark energy, the dark matter. And the dark matter, the evidence for dark matter, I don't need to explain to you. We have seen it many times here already, I guess. These are most likely objects, yeah, and not just a, um, a fluid, it's a objects of a certain mass, but with very weak coupling to known matter. That's why we haven't seen it, and we have to find it. We can also produce it <clears throat> artificially at the LHC if the coupling is strong enough, but the coupling is very weak. So far, we haven't seen a thread of it. Dark energy, big mystery. <clears throat> Dark energy is a scalar form of energy like the Higgs boson. If we understand Higgs mechanisms and the Higgs potential, maybe we are able to formulate a theory. It's you theorists, where are they? They have to do this, you know? We experimentalists have no clue on dark energy. and We cannot give it to you. You have to think about it. So that is the situation of our knowledge, no? But the case for continuing with the LHC is this here. We have to explore whether we find massive objects in the reach of the LHC and with the coupling of a many years long LHC run. That should be possible. That's the plan for it. I don't go through that since the plan also changes all the time. 
Uh, so uh, at the moment, we are taking run three data here. And in a few years, we will have a long shutdown and we replace part of the detector. And Karlsruhe is really deeply involved. Now my successor has taken over. This shows only the challenge when you have many collisions at one time in the detector. It looks like this. Very difficult to resolve, so you need a new detector. And so for this, I invited, actually, assembled all the CMS groups who are working on the upgrade to a meeting in uh, Bad Herrenalp, my little hometown. Yeah? So we had the meetings during uh, half a week in Karlsruhe and the university, and then we took an old clock, uh, old uh, train uh, to go to Herrenalp and then feast and eat and drink and have fun. Yeah? And uh, you see, they're all smiling. I mean, mostly are men, and they all smile. Now, guess why? You know, being in an old train and so on. This something caters to the uh, uh, to uh, memories when you were a child and played with trains and so on. This is very special. You have to rent it. Yeah, it doesn't go normally. Anyhow, so here actually is my successor. I didn't know in those days that he would be my successor eventually. This is a typical woman, Schwarzwald woman. You know, they have those heads with the four. Yellow, uh, red balls, and then they dance. Not she, but uh, the, uh, there were some dances. So maybe one can repeat this at some stage. Or I convinced my cosmic ray friends to have a meeting of this kind of real German culture yeah, in the Schwarzwald. And home brewing beer. The, the local police has a little lab where they grow beer. I just found out recently. So even the police does beer so in Germany. Yeah, these are developments I don't need to. This was a meeting where the people really came together to work. So that's uh, on developments. And that's it. Uh, we are experiencing a historical period with respect to the search for the fundamental question of nature. More than 10,000 people from 50 nations built the world machine. That's what the Large Hadron Collider was called in those days. Uh, and that is now 13 years in operation. The observation of the Higgs boson now 10 years ago is a discovery of fundamental importance. However, important questions about Big Bang and the universe remain unanswered. So I guess in 10 years, somebody else gives the same colloquium again, and I hope with some more conclusions than what I can give you now. I only can show you how a dark matter particle would look like in our detector. We know that. We only have to find it. You see this here? It's a simulation event of dark matter production and decay. So you can simulate it with a computer. You can do the whole analysis, the whole LHC run, only you have to find it in reality. Now that's where we are going. OK, otherwise, of course, we want more. CERN wants more. We want a 100-kilometer ring in the Geneva area. You see that's Mont Blanc. By the way, it's also a nice area here, you know, Lake Geneva, but it looks a bit like here, Bariloche. So since Europe has already its big accelerator, uh, now it's time that the Americas gets a big accelerator. And if I look at this picture, I could imagine one at Bariloche would not be such a bad place. You know, you have to make a little bit more uh, propaganda. It's 25 billion euros. So then uh, I would come here to work on it, and many other people as well. So, so much for now. Th uh, thank you. Thank you much, Thomas, for your interesting talk and also the interesting subject, which is reflecting the fact that we have a lot of students. It's very important yeah, it for us. Of course, for the students. Mm -hmm. They have to do the work. Yeah. So, we just can enjoy. Also. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the session is open. Question, comment, suggestions also. Which is the first? Thank you. Very, very interesting for someone who is not working in, in high energy physics and this, so it's always very nice to see this uh, general talks. Uh, my question is, Thomas, and how is it uh, that you expect to see or to measure what are the changes or the improvements you have to make to see dark uh, energy? What is the 
the, the, the change that has to be made to the collider, or what are you looking for? Actually, uh, we, uh, first of all, dark energy is something we have no idea how to look for. No, it dark either. matter. Dark sorry, matter. Sorry. No? sorry. Yeah, 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 dark I know matter. People, sorry. You need, of course, some models which are, um, uh, they must have a particle nature, a certain mass, and then uh, they need a certain coupling to matter. If they, the coupling to matter was zero, we would, of course, not see it, never. But if there is, uh, it's not known what the coupling is, but if it's even very small, uh, you could eventually produce it uh, in the collisions. I go back to this here. And then, uh, of course, you can say we need for such and such sensitivity, the detector has to perform such and such so we see it and separate it from background. No? Back, uh, normally, collisions give you everything you want, but you're not only sure uh, if that is what you really uh, found is what you want, you have to have a very, very good understanding of the model and of the detector itself. It ca can be done. And the improvement of the detector is not so much to may, may be even more sensitive to dark matter, but rather to survive the very dire conditions. I go back once more here, just this illustrates it. At the high luminosities, at the high collision rates, you know? You need high collision rates to get many events, so that if the coupling is small, you still have a chance that it is produced sometimes uh, after. And then you have to work with a, a, a situation which looks like that. Your detector has to survive that. That is why we are rebuilding. We are not, uh, we also have a more resolution device in front. That is true. That, but essentially, the idea is to survive. That. Just to finish, I'm amazed that there are only three years after the first collisions, as far as I understood, the Higgs boson was discovered. So this is amazing. Yes, it is amazing. It is because um, you had 600 people uh, just waiting and concentrating and looking and running computers just for this, you know. We had a, not a perfect idea, but we had a fairly good idea where to look for. You know? The mass window is not so big, so they said, well, we look between a mass of 110 GeV and 130 GeV. How should it look like, and so on. They looked for signatures. So this could be done. We needed just the statistics to show, to prove that it was something and not uh, the background. It's a good question. Huh? So, so yes, uh, three years sound very little, but um, uh, the detector was ready, it was calibrated with COSMICS, by the way. Imagine, COSMICS uh, goes through uh, 80 meters of ground down to the detector, and we can use it very nicely to calibrate. I mean, muons, 80 meters, no problem for them, so. Yes. I have a question about your last slide when you were talking about how a dark matter detection would look in the LHC. My question is, is that dependent on the model of the dark matter? I mean, it's where it's an axion or a WIMP or oh. something else. Axions you can forget, not like that. We cannot see it. No? Uh, but WIMPs uh, are the ones, the objects. Now, uh, you, of course, we have data from all searches from the direct scattering experiments. We know what are the limits of the cross-section for WIMPs versus a certain mass. No? Then. Uh, you say, do they still fit into this picture here? Can we see WIMPs, which we have not seen in uh, the direct search experiments, but can they be produced here nevertheless? Yes, there are many windows to look for. It's like with axions. You, as an expert, uh, you have millions of scenarios for axions, so all masses and couplings and so on. Uh, axions we would never see here. That's not possible. What, what is that? The, the yeah, axions are very light particles. Uh, you have to um, identify them in one way. And uh, uh, they would go out here as missing energy. No? So you have to produce them. Uh, but through what do you produce an axion so that you get a signature which is very significant? I mean, if you have a dark matter um, event, I go once more, uh, just to illustrate. So here, uh, you would have, um, um, that's already an old picture, it's 
somewhere in the, this scheme you have you have photons you are, and you have also missing energy going somewhere but where is it going I, I it's so for illustration somewhere in one direction the dark matter object is going and missing energy and it can be produced from the decay of a su pair of supersymmetric particles you know if you have real if you have supersymmetry and long time ago we believed in it then the lightest supersymmetric particle would be dark matter and the next lightest particle would decay into it. But the, that would decay into dark matter plus uh, visible matter. No? The R parity is conserved. And so that is something you can see from its, uh, the overall balance. Axions, um, to my mind, I mean, I know the way how they are produced is, for instance, from uh, uh, magnetic, uh, I mean, the axions can come from uh, the Primakov effect, uh, in this, uh, from photons, you can have um, axion, how was it? You have an axion being produced, like light uh, shines through the wall. You send light through, through a wall, uh, I mean, the axion goes through the wall, and the other side, the axion, if you have a strong magnetic field, it forms again a, a photon, yeah? So, that is what you do. You have an uh, axion which goes into a magnetic field and makes a photon through this Primakov effect. This uh, we don't have here. This option is not there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. More questions? Thank you for the interesting overview. Uh, I have a question regarding the talents in the context of this project. Do you think there is a lack of talents in Karlsruhe? There is, I, I read the news that there is like a personal mangel in, in German uh, <laughs> in Karlsruhe uh, or in the surroundings. But so, what do you think? So far not. I mean, our group uh, is one of the largest groups at all. Uh, my group, I mean, when I still was the head, we had 100 uh, people uh, signed into uh, the CMS project, 100. So uh, personal mangel, we were not suffering, but personal mangel in reality is, of course, in Germany very abundant. Uh, abundant. We don't have enough uh, technicians uh, to uh, paint your walls and repair your windows and everything. Everything you, is, uh, people are missing, that's true, it's funny. Uh, lots of tasks. Maybe, um, I mean, I've been reflecting over this. It's not a German, it's a European problem. Um, Europe, and Germany in particular, was destroyed after the war completely. Yeah? And so rebuilt after the war completely. Brand new everything, wonderful. Concrete, quickly done, cheap. And now, 70 years later, everything is decaying at the same time. So you need to improve. Like my house, I need to improve many things, and I don't get anybody to do it for me, you know? So I say, hey, please, I pay your money, I don't know. They don't even come, you know? So we make them, so, we dis so that's a general problem. Bakeries, we have here, Bäckerei, I've seen with pleasure. You have all the, our bakeries now here in Argentine. We need bakeries in Germany. So and, and those who go at four o'clock in the night and work in the bakery, those people don't do that anymore. But. LHC, yeah, you find enough people. That's still uh, something where they ca come to, yes, fortunately. So I don't know if I really answered your question, but along those lines, hmm? it's a general problem. Also, we have not so many people coming. I know, I understood that Argentine is, has a fairly stable population. You get lots of children. Yesterday, we couldn't help but being run over by sweet children everywhere going on the railroad, and I thought, yeah, that's the future of Argentine. We don't have many children anymore in Germany, no? so. More questions? Okay, I would, I would like to know about the, the policy for sharing the, the data uh, taken for this, for example, for this um, equipment made by you. Um, is the, the, policy, the, for example, the data is totally open, is full open for all the all no. the groups that... These are important discussions, and uh, 
uh, I mean, it is so that we are in a kind of a scientific competition eh, with others. And <clears throat> so the co collaboration has a duty and also the privilege to first look alone at the data. Imagine you showed the data to Atlas that uh, it doesn't matter, but it would influence their judgment about their own data. Mm -hmm. So you would distort your picture and uh, you would say, ah, oh, yeah, but they see here a resonance. Let's look if we find something there. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, maybe we have to change the tuning a little bit, then we also get something. This is no science. We have to keep the data in, under wraps until they are published. But there are discussions of making available to the public certain selection of data, which also can be uh, understood. You know, because uh, when you have complex d data, then people can draw their uh, wrong conclusions because they don't know the corrections to the they are very complex. No, it's not simple data. It's very, very complex. I mean, I couldn't do it myself. So uh, you need teams to analyze, to say, okay, here, this was a crack in the acceptance and so on. So that makes it a little bit difficult what kind of data you give when and to whom. It's not that we w uh, want to keep it for ourselves. No, it is more uh, that they are, should be useful and being used. But this is coming because that's policy in Europe that those data, data have to be made public. It's the ownership of all, all taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, we, then we close the colloquium. And uh, thanks again, Thomas. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.